Good afternoon. Welcome to the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute Lunch and Learn series. My name is Paige Shee, Strategic Partners Officer for GTMI. To ensure a seamless presentation experience today, audience members are muted during the presentation. However, we encourage you to submit any questions you may have for the speaker as they arise using the Q&A panel on your screen, and we'll address all Q&A uh, at the end of the lecture. The Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute is one of 11 interdisciplinary research institutes at Georgia Tech. We uniquely focus on manufacturing research, development, and deployment. We tackle the grand challenges of today's manufacturers and assist our partners with moving innovations from the lab to the marketplace. GTMI has a wide array of facilities and equipment located on main campus for basic research and in our advanced manufacturing pilot facility for applied research. GTMI's mission includes education and workforce training, collaborative partnerships with industry, academia, and government, as well as thought leadership. Today, we are pleased to welcome Alan Anling, who will present the e-commerce waterfall, insights on supply chain in a post-COVID world. E-commerce trends accelerated three to five years during the COVID-19 pandemic, challenging both companies and service providers in the supply chain. This discussion will cover the critical supply chain impacts of this e-commerce waterfall from recent interviews conducted by the University of Tennessee on the future of transportation, key issues and opportunities faced by supply chain leaders and the solutions they're turning to both now and in the future will be reviewed, including new distribution and delivery models, digitalizing the supply chain, truck size technology power choices, and warehouse robotics. The presentation will conclude with a discussion of the implications of the on-demand consumer on manufacturing. Alan Amling is a TED speaker and thought leader on harnessing digital disruption for success. Alan helped to drive innovation over a 27-year career with UPS and is currently a fellow at the University of Tennessee, CEO of advisory firm Thrive and Advance LLC, and on the executive advisory board for the Georgia Tech Manufacturing Institute. He researches, invests, advises, and speaks on innovation in manufacturing and logistics and how firms can recognize and thrive in disruption. At Tennessee, Allen teaches a strategy course in the Master of Supply Chain program. His research focuses on industry 4.0 technology applications and the e-commerce driven transformation of the supply chain. He is a contributor to the Wall Street Journal and his first book, Organizational Velocity, is scheduled for publication in 2021. Alan's latest role at UPS was VP Corporate Strategy, where he helped revitalize UPS innovation and venture capital programs for the digital economy. He moved into this role after serving as VP of Marketing for UPS Global Logistics and Distribution. Alan holds a PhD in Management from Kennesaw State University, an MBA from Indiana University, and a BA in Business and Psychology from Lewis and Clark College. Please join me in welcoming Alan Amling. You may now begin your presentation. All right, thank you so much, Paige, for that kind introduction. And it's really good to be with all of you uh, for this Lunch and Learn session today. So supply chains in a post-COVID world, it almost seems a little strange to be talking about post-COVID. We, we had some really interesting news on, on both ends of the spectrum uh, today. On the, on the one hand, we have record infections. And so it seems like this um, pandemic will, will never end. On, on the other hand, we got great news from Pfizer today about the efficacy of their uh, virus vaccine. Um, but one thing's for certain, this pandemic has changed a lot of things uh, forever. Um, and what the area that we're gonna focus on today is the supply chain and the trends we're going to discuss are not necessarily new uh, but they've been put on steroids uh, during the pandemic um, and what i'm going to talk about is as Paige said i i did some interviews earlier this year of supply chain leaders across various industries and it was really more of a future of transportation type research um, but what I was just, uh, what I found was that um, e-commerce and the pressures around e-commerce and quick delivery um, just seemed it was A led to B and B led to C and C led to D. It was like a waterfall effect of issues that were hitting manufacturers and retailers and logistics companies. And so 
Um, today, you know, that's that's really what I want to uh, focus on with you. Um, again, I'll, I'm going to start out with, you know, kind of what are the big nuggets that we heard, um, but but then drill di drill down on on last mile. But er everyone knows that the e-commerce has really accelerated during COVID-19. You know, just in the second quarter of this year, Walmart e-commerce sales were up 97%, 195% at Target, 242% at Best Buy. And we could talk about Costco and all the other um, retailers that were considered essential. Um, it really changed everything. And, um, and while post COVID, you know, we're not going to see those kind of growth numbers post COVID. Um, many of these changes are not going back. Um, you know, millions of people tried, you know, buying groceries online um, for curbside delivery for the first time. Um, literally hundreds of, of retailers that never did ship from store are doing ship from store. Um, and these changes that have happened during the pandemic, um, we're not going to go back to the pre-pandemic world. This is a new uh, a new era in manufacturing and supply chain. So again, the the big mega trend is this idea of the e-commerce waterfall, and I call it that just because I was just overwhelmed with everyone I talked to, whether you know it didn't matter where they were in the supply chain or what industry they were in, it hit everybody. Um, and it was, you know, it, it was really driven by this idea of, you know, you've got um, consumer demands that have really been there, these new demands um, since the dawn of time, but they began accelerating in the mid 90s as the um, internet became popularized and people had access to the greatest source of power since the dawn of time, information. And they increasingly wanted what they want, when they want it, and and where they want it. Um, and those, so those aren't new, um, but they went on steroids. They accelerated during pandemic, and it creates all sorts of issues up and down the supply chain: rising complexity, new cost and service pressures, uh, network changes. We're going to talk about each one of these things. And then there's some new solutions um, that came up. And so this first part of the presentation, we're going to drill down and talk about each of these areas and some of the findings. And then again, and then we're again, we're going to drill down on the the last mile because in in my you know years in, in supply chain, you know, the 27 years with UPS. I've never seen anything like it. Um, this is the biggest transformation of supply chain um, that, that I've seen in my career, and and we're going to see um, we're going to see changes to existing power structures because there's a lot of investment in in startups and so forth uh, to um, fill gaps in the market that have been created by all of these changes, and so we'll talk about that as well. So let's dive into it. Um, one of the big things that um, we heard, and this is really driven by e-commerce, is um, item prol proliferation or stock keeping unit, SKU uh, proliferations. Um, you know, the demand for choice has gone up. And it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's not just what you would consider, um, you know, your common e-commerce products. It, it's I was talking to a, um, a liquor uh, distributor who who said that you know they're feeling the strain because people are um, demanding greater selection of craft beer and whiskey and bourbon. You know, just if if you if you shop for beer even in a like a Publix or a Kroger, all of the different varieties, um, it creates a tremendous tre uh, pressure on the supply chain because you have to have 
more selection and those um, more unique products don't turn as often. Um, so it creates a lot of pressure. Now, during the pandemic, we did see some reversal of this SKU proliferation trend. Um, as, as companies started to, to you know, scale back on sizes, varieties, so that they could fulfill demand in the supply chain. Um, my assumption is that uh, the trend for fewer SKUs is that caused by the pandemic uh, will reverse itself, um, but, uh, but that is yet to be seen. Network complexity. So, you know, I expected to um, hear a lot about um, network complexity, about, um, you know, the issues with um, single source suppliers, um, you know, you know, the companies that only had supply out of China, um, you know, really took a hit during uh, the initial part of, of the pandemic. So the idea of more regionalization of, um, uh, of supply, I heard that a lot. I didn't, you know, there's a lot of talk about reshoring back to the, the U.S. I, I did hear some of that, but, but quite frankly, it's, it's more likely that companies are going to go from China to South Asia or Mexico than, than Detroit. Um, the, the movement from business to business to business consumer means that facilities that were built to break down bulk, you know, big bulk orders. Um, well, let me go back there. Um, big bulk orders. Uh, have to break down into to smaller deliveries. Um, you know, I, I had one professional, supply chain professional, tell me that normally they would have 50 pick faces in a warehouse of so 50 different areas where they pick. Um, that has exploded to 300, which causes a lot of pressure on space and efficiency in the warehouse. And this compression in order fulfillment isn't just um, you know, is it just for the last mile? It has uh, reverberating effects all the way up the supply chain. So smaller and lighter shipment. So um, as more deliveries go to homes versus stores, shipments are, are lighter. Their um, transportation segments tend to are, are, are trending shorter. Um, and 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 that's been that's been a trend again that has been happening that has accelerated during the pandemic, um, but there there has been the opposite as well. You know we're getting used to buying everything online. Um, you know during the pandemic they were selling like um, you know million dollar paintings and and vintage cars uh, online, which you know I. You know, I didn't think that would happen, but uh, it, it's it's happening, and it's getting more popular to, you know, buy furniture, and you know, people are buying cars and um, appliances. But that creates all sorts of issues as well. Um, one uh, one interviewee uh, purchased a refrigerator online, and it was delivered to their residential community in a 50, 53 foot trailer <laughs> going into the subdivision. Uh, but it's all the, the um, that the company had available to deliver, um, and so there's uh, there's a lot of kind of unintended consequences of this uh, this e-commerce e-commerce waterfall, and the vehicle types that are available to companies to deliver uh, to homes is is one area where we're seeing change. Um, Manufacturers um, are seeing an increase in demand to go directly to smaller format China channels that they may have serviced through distributors um, in the past. Um, and direct to consumer is is continuing to rise, you know, even for manufacturers. And it's not just Warby Parker glasses and Casper mattresses, it's Nike. It's Procter and Gamble, it's Clorox. Um, 
all of these companies are are making inroads into direct to consumer and and that changes as a manufacturer some of the things that you need thinking about um, in terms of around packaging and uh, channel conflict and those sorts of things. And and last I put on a driver quality of life because one of the things that you know that I heard is that you know firms are trying to improve the quality of life for um, for drivers, so they're doing shorter routes and more team driving. Um, that's more of an impact on the lo logistics side. But, you know, the average age of a truck driver in the U.S. is about 50 years old. Um, we, we've had for some years a, uh, uh, an issue with driver retention and, and, um, and recruiting drivers. Um, and, you know, one potential answer is autonomy. Um, we'll talk about that a little later, um, but uh, but the availability of drivers uh, continues to be an issue. So cost pressure and service pressure. So you know every everyone knows uh, free shipping is not free. Um, even though all of us as consumers we demand it, right? It it feels um, it doesn't feel good when. <laughs> When a retailer is is charging you uh, charging you shipping, um, and when you think about the number of prime members and um, and, and so forth, you you kind of expect it uh, now. Um, and and so all of that you know that demand for for free delivery and understanding that on the supply chain side it's not free is is creating all sorts of cost pressures. And then there's there's service pressures, you know, not just for the fast delivery, but for more selection, better quality, um, you know, more value added services, services that that surround the the physical product. Um, all of these are new, um, and they add to the complexity in the in the supply chain. And then and then this one we'll talk about in the last mile a little more, but I, I mean, this is causing the most change, even more than the increasing e-commerce is this demand for same day and, and next day. Got, you know, just take Amazon and Walmart, which between those two, they make up about um, half of e-commerce sales in the U.S. And so, you know, just over the last year, you've had, Walmart, uh, or excuse me, Amazon Prime going from Prime two day to Prime one day. And so they're completely reconfiguring their network. They're adding um, new local fulfillment um, capabilities, what they call delivery stations. Um, they have about 400 of those in the United States right now. They've, they've announced plans for a thousand more. So get, Think about this, like 1,400. They're going to be in uh, nearly every local community except for rural areas, uh, you know, in the next in the next couple years. And then you've got um, Walmart, which is already delivering from over 2,500 stores. Um, and and all of this in order to provide you know quicker delivery service. And um, one one of the most interesting things that I found during the um, the pandemic is the number of neighbors that they know I'm in the logistics industry. So any logistics issue that they have, they uh, they tend to complain to me. And um, and one of those issues was especially in that kind of April time frame, like Amazon and Walmart delivery times were were getting you know, pushed out three days, four days or, or, or longer um, when they were used to, you know, ordering it one day and getting it the next. And I just smiled because it was not that long ago, the two to five day delivery was the gold standard. And now that's table stakes and it's moving to uh, same day, next day. And that's gonna have supply, really profound implications on the supply chain. Um, and so the solutions, so 
there's all sorts of solutions that have, you know, we just talked about ship from store, but, you know, again, everyone's doing it. Um, <clears throat> grocery stores are doing it. Um, you know, the, uh, the retail, the big box retailers that didn't have it before are now doing uh, ship from store. And there's this big movement right now to get goods closer to the end customer. Um, so they can do the same day and, and next day. Um, the real estate um, company CBRE um, just issued a report that uh, about the increasing demand for smaller warehouses, say 70 to 120,000 square feet that are closer to consumers. Um, rents are up, availability is down, um, both by about a third. And, um, and we're at the, the front end of a trend to convert uh, shopping mall space to kind of localized distribution center. This idea of uh, hyper-local fulfillment is, is really gaining steam um, in, the, in the market. And I'm, I'm hearing it all over the place. I, you know, I, I do a lot of work in the startup community and there's, you know, there's tons of, uh, interest from private equity firms and venture capital firms um, in this area. Um, you know, and 3PLs are, are making changes as well and experimenting with new models, doing more kind of multi-client type, type warehouses. Um, and then automation and robotics uh, has been a, you know, a big area a solution of solutions that co companies are are looking at. The, the companies that I interviewed um, were mainly looking at uh, autonomous mobile robots. That was probably the most popular trend that I saw. These are companies like Fetch Robotics and Local Robotics, companies where it's a cobot. It's 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 not the robot doing everything. It's robots working in collaboration with with humans to to be more efficient um, in the warehouse um, you know these these picking robots um, are becoming more mainstream um, my favorite story is a company called dorabot um, back in um, 20 i guess it was around 2013 when i was at ups i had an intern uh, from China, it was part of a Georgia Tech program, as a matter of fact, um, where uh, they came, he was from China, came in and worked at UPS, and then the ID he was go going to go back to China and work for UPS in China, which he did for a little while, and then he got, got together with some of his um, uh, friends that uh, were into AI and machine learning, and they created this uh, picking robot that can, you know, can now sort about 700 to 1,000 pieces per hour, um, you know, depending on the, on the application. It's basically a robotic arm, picks, picks packages up off a belt, sorts them into a bin. A bin could be 48-way split or, or more. Um, but what's so interesting is that um, this, uh, this gentleman now has, you know, is worth more than I'm, I've made in my entire career. Uh, he was my intern and he has working for him, the guy that was the number two uh, senior manager at UPS um, when I was there is now working for my former intern. That's how, how fast things are, are moving in this, in this area. And um, the companies that you'll see um, here are um, uh, Swiss Log, they have a product called Auto Store, Takeoff Technologies, Atabotics are some of the companies in this area. So uh, the market drivers, uh, we, we talked about this shorter, more mo modular freight movements. Um, but um, these shorter shipments are uh, enabling um, more electric, um, vehicles, because you know one of the issues with electric trucks is the is the the distance. 
um, because we don't have the charging infrastructure in place. That's been kind of a, a chicken and the egg um, type type issue. But you know, when I when I talk to the supply chain leaders, they're they're generally very high on these electric or EV trucks. Um, you know, whether it's uh, a rival or or Tesla or kind of the malign Nikola, um, there's a, a lot of um, uh, of this technology that um, that we're going to start to see on the roads, um, hopefully this year, but more like likely it will be uh, kind of mid mid year next year that we'll start to see these these companies. Um, most of the you know most of the new vehicles have uh, level two autonomy, so the the um, truck can steer, accelerate, and brake in in certain circumstances. That's becoming um, more commonplace, and um, and and you know you're starting to see the cost come down. Uh, the big deal is we need to get the charging uh, infrastructure in place. Autonomous was a different story. Um, you know, while there's a lot of hype around autonomy, the executives that I interviewed were much less ex excited about the near-term prospects of autonomy due to government regulations and a perceived increase in risk and liability. And that those were really big deals. You know, they, you know, you think about an 80,000 pound truck, autonomous truck going down the the highway, they were so concerned about liability and risk to their their brand name if there was an accident. Um, now they all genuinely believe that it's you know it is coming that it will be lower cost. It will actually be safer than a human driver on the road. Um, but but you know getting over this uh, this fear of the the liability would be an issue. So. What, what we are seeing in autonomy that um, is that we think will um, gain traction earlier is the platooning type models like like a peloton technology where you have a human driver in the front cab and an autonomous vehicle following it um, at uh, at UPS they're doing some very interesting things they're working with uh, Gaussen um, on autonomous shifters and so if you go to a distribution center and you see those trailers backed up side by side well once they're being done being um, unloaded they pull them out and pull in a, a fully loaded truck uh, to then begin the unloading process that's all done manually right now and these gaussian shifters are doing it kind of within a geofenced location um, uh, autonomously but it's much easier to control. They're all on private property. It's all geofenced, um, and it's kind of a limited application. But um, but that's really good. We're also seeing drones um, being used in kind of geofenced locations, whether it's a um, a medical campus um, or uh, you know one of the really cool tests that are going on right now is with UPS and CVS. Um, in Florida, delivering um, uh, pharmaceutical prescriptions to a large retirement community there. And then digitalization, um, you know, the, the quick story here is, it really, is really summed up in this one quote that a leader gave me is, we want to get to a point where there's no friction, there's no stopping, there's no electronic, there's no electronic transfer. There's no reason for bill of ladings. There's nothing at all that that they're able to reduce the friction in their uh, supply chain by digitizing it um, and not having any paper or swivel chair integration where you're taking information out of one system and then turning around and typing it into another. Um, and then there's a, a, a rise in collaboration. Um, where companies are, you know, um, uh, putting their spare capacity up on the market, whether it's a shared warehousing or kind of market or a truck sharing, 
Um, and uh, you've got more startups in this space as well. Um, companies like Stored uh, and Flex, um, where uh, they're actually uh, matching com companies up that, that have uh, excess where warehouse capacity. And so you can um, get warehouse capacity, you know, just for a certain period of time without uh, having to sign a long-term contract. Um, there is a downside though. All of these sharing models um, require excess capacity, either in the warehouse or in labor or in vehicles. And um, you can't, that's not always going to be the case all the time. Um, so that's just one caveat of the, the sharing models. And then the big, one of the one of the biggest trends is the importance of, of AI uh, and its sister uh, machine learning. Um, when you when you get to these kind of this local fulfillment where you're going from you know three to five regional distribution centers to maybe 50 or 100 or more, um, you can't duplicate your inventory in all of those different locations. So it's extremely important that you get really, really good at um, predictive analytics in what product needs to go where, because in the supply chain, everyone knows inventory is the devil. And you can, if if you try to duplicate the same kind of inventory you had at the regional distribution centers and those local um, fulfillment centers, um, your your inventory carrying costs would go through the roof. So that's why inventory placement in this new world is is really the secret sauce um, for for success. Um, one more. Okay. So again, we 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 talked about the um, market drivers. Just a little bit on on last mile or really last yard. Um, there's a, a trend, and, and I heard about this um, from a number of companies around the need to have more customized delivery options, whether it's delivering to someone's trunk when they're at work, trunk of their car, their doorstep, um, an alternate delivery center, maybe a like a hardware store or um, or, or some other local local store. Um, and the other area is just the number of things that are being ordered and delivered online. I talked about fine art and, and these classic autos, but uh, prepared food, grocery, pharma, general merchandise, big and bulky, everything is going online. Um, and so you've got a host of solution providers that are coming in to fill those voids um, in the in the service portfolio, whether it's you know um, brokers, broker models, digital brokers, contractor models, gig models, um, all that. But it is one of the things that that requires is um, an increasing amount of of integration. So I I went through that pretty fast. So a number of big issues and solutions, but now I want to drill down a little bit on last mile, kind of in the last last 10 minutes. Um, and this quote really sums it up. Um, it's friends typically don't go in reverse. You know, once we get used to a certain level of service, um, it's really hard to go backwards. And it's it's possible that consumers will go back to accepting a two to five day delivery standard if they're they're properly incented, but it's not likely. Um, and that leads us to this idea of local pickup, local delivery. Um, and that changes everything. And if you take nothing else away from this presentation, this one slide, local pickup, local delivery changes everything. Um, instead of needing a last mile carrier with a national network, for example, if you're 
picking up locally, there are literally dozens of options uh, that weren't available in yesterday's supply chain. Um, and again, inventory placement uh, becomes the key to profitability. And, um, you know, the companies that are doing a really good job of this um, have tremendous uh, uh, capabilities or, with with their data scientists. And, and um, you know, I know Georgia Tech graduates a lot of data, data scientists every year, um, but there are not enough kids uh, graduating with that specialty than there, than there are needs in, in the market right now. To the extent that, you know, Amazon had to create their own ML university um, that they, they run uh, near their Seattle uh, location. Um, and, you know, you can do this experiment as, as, as well. Go on LinkedIn and type in data science in Amazon or data science in Walmart and then data science in more of a traditional carrier or retailer. And you're going to see a huge difference in the, the number of people working in those locations um, with the data science or title or an AI title. Uh, and that's because these companies get it that the real um, emerging nexus of competitive advantage in this new era of last mile is around AI and ML and predictive analytics and making sure you have the right product at the right place at the right time. So I, I just wrote an article that was published last month in the Wall Street Journal about this. And in the article, excuse me, in the article, I argue that the incumbent carrier strategies are going to need to change, but it goes beyond the incumbent carriers. Again, there are a lot of different um, options out there. Um, we talked about ship from store. You know, in January, 19 of the top 500 retailers offered curbside pickup. By August of 20, 29, um, August of 2020. So eight months later, um, uh, over 121 of those 500 offered this. So you can see um, how it's how it's taken off. These hyperlocal fulfillment strategies are are taking root. Whether it's you know companies like Dark Store, Stored, Flex, um, and, and new technologies like that coming from companies like Fabric and Takeoff Technologies. Um, and so you, and you have a lot of ac action you, in the middle. You see the picture in the middle here. You see Safeway. You know, you've got these grocery stores and other retailers that are co converting some of their retail space for uh, e-commerce fulfillment. And again, we're seeing a big move right now around how to make better use of, of mall space. In the bottom left, you see Amazon delivery. What's really key there, if you read that sign, they say flex um, delivery van. So out of those delivery centers, um, the deliveries are actually happening by contractors. That's the Amazon logistics vans with the little smile and gig workers. That's the Amazon uh, flex um, solution. But these new entrants uh, in delivery are, are gaining a, a foothold. And you may find some of these things surprising. So in December of 2017, Target purchase shipped for $550 million. I thought that was a ton of money. I didn't understand it. But then um, in July of this year, Uber purchases Postmates, a similar uh, delivery uh, on-demand delivery company for $2.65 billion. So that that seemed to make a lot of lot of sense. And then you've got these these smaller companies like DoorDash and Instacart, and it might surprise you, it surprised me. Um, these companies, you know, you might think compared to a UPS or a FedEx, oh, okay, forget about it. They're getting really expensive. Um, DoorDash is now valued at 16 billion, Instacart at, at almost 18 billion. Um, and these on-demand warehouse companies that I've talked about, uh, these four that I've listed here have collectively raised over $120 million. And um, 
And so there's tremendous change going on. And, and this change has really been accelerated. And I think about this concept of the Overton window, um, where ideas move from unthinkable you know, to mainstream. It's typically, people talk about the Overton window in terms of issues that are related to politics, but it applies to this as well. And one of the areas that is just so fascinating to me is around the physical internet. So um, many of you, be, because you're familiar with Georgia Tech and you, you may be familiar with the physical internet, um, which uh, was started with a, a, a publication 10 years ago um, from uh, Dr. Montreux uh, from the supply chain department at, um, at Georgia Tech. And the idea is basically that like information travels in packets and packets and switches freely from point A to point B, that you could do that with um, physical goods as well. Um, and I was really excited about this when I was at, at UPS. So I brought this to our senior management team um, about uh, seven years ago. And, um, and I was really excited about it. The presentation actually uh, went over like a lead balloon. And the reason it did, it was unthinkable at that time because, you know, why would I own the assets? Why would I want to share assets that I own and, and provide that accessibility and advantage to potential competitors? It seemed unthinkable at the time. Um, but now you're seeing a tremendous number of sharing options out in the market. And now it's moving um, you know, it's moved to radical and now it's becoming acceptable. It's starting to move down the, uh, down into uh, becoming popular and eventually becoming uh, accepted. And so I think that's really interesting. And, and the big question for the asset owners is, um, could an open market for the use of their resources uh, be more profitable than a closed network? So, the, to to end here, I've got um, just three more slides, and I'm not going to talk to you about you know what are the eight steps that you need to take um, to succeed in this environment, or um, you know these are the technologies that you need to adopt, because quite frankly these answers are always context specific. What I'm going to talk about is three mindsets of companies that I've I've interviewed in um, my academic research as well as my professional research. Um, and it's really around three mindsets of, of companies that are that are doing really well in this environment. So mindset number one, go on offense. Do not play defense, go on offense. So this um, this quote um, is from Herman Balk. Um, he was um, a member of uh, the German Panzer troops, uh, or a leader of the German Panzer troops in World War II. Um, you know, the U.S. gathered a tremendous amount of information about strategy, war strategy, um, from interviewing the German generals after the war. And, and one of those was Hermann Balk, and he's probably most famous for um, taking on the uh, Soviet uh, Fifth Army. Uh, he was, you know, outnumbered uh, 15 to 1 in tanks, 11 to 1 in in, in infantry, and and he he wiped out the um, the Soviet fifth tank army in a couple of weeks. Well, how did he do that? It was novelty and it was repeated thrusts. It was try one thing, try another thing. And, you know, they would try and back off. It wasn't a sustained attack. It was, um, it was a continuous attack. Um, and and this, this provides a lot of information. You know, think about what, what Amazon has done to, you know, a lot of companies. They're, they're coming out with something new. Like it seems like almost every week or at least every month uh, that is impacting companies. And so these companies are on roller skates. And, um, and so you have to get on offense. You have to be the attacker. And so if you're a manufacturer, you know, 
how do you take advantage of some of these trends going direct to consumer? How do you change your packaging for in e-commerce versus in-store sales? How do you create more flexibility and agility in your operations to uh, to deal with increasing demands um, for for selection? How do you get in front of this and go on offense? If you're a third-party logistics company, you know, experimenting with hyper-local fulfillment, leveraging existing relationships. How do you how do you bundle some of these new offerings with your old offerings uh, to create a, a better portfolio. If you're a carrier, if you're an incumbent carrier, you know, you can't cede this fast growing local delivery market to startups. You know, how do you create um, potentially unexpected partnerships with uh, retail companies? Um, how do you move upstream to create uh, new revenue streams? Because face it, that's one of the biggest issues, one of the Biggest investors in logistics over the last five years have not been logistics companies. It's retailers from in China, um, Alibaba and JD.com to Amazon, um, Walmart, Costco bought uh, a delivery company, Target bought shipped. There's all sorts of investments going on in here. Um, and so we, we talked about the tremendous innovation for the retailers. Building snowmobiles. I'm not going to go into the, the, the full idea because we don't have time right now, but building snowmobiles is an analogy for high adaptability, essentially taking different parts, things that you already have in the company and rearranging them to create a new value proposition. Um, so what assets do you have that can be reconfigured to attack a new market? Um, one of the great examples of this was Fujifilm, where Kodak was trying to monetize its R&D in, in its core business, photography. Um, did the uh, Fujifilm took a different route when, you know, it went from film to digital photography. They took their expertise in nanotechnology for placing chemicals on films and applied that to applying cosmetics in uh, facial skin, which is a big business for them right now. And uh, their experience with photosensitive materials um, helped it with fine chemicals and industrial materials, which is another big business of, of theirs. Um, so they ended up really thriving by taking capabilities they had and applying them um, to a, a different market. And last but not least, make lives better. So um, one moment. One of my favorite um, management uh, gurus is the late great uh, Clayton Christensen who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma. And one of the things that he talks about is making sure that you solve for insufficient wealth, access, skill, and time. And so more generally, what you hear is these companies having an extreme focus on the customer, not, you know, not just focusing on selling what they sell, but selling what the consumer needs. Um, but these are areas where wealth, access, skill, and time, you can think about um, how your value proposition or how you can improve your value proposition um, to make lives better um, for, for your consumers. And the companies that are really succeeding today are finding a way to do this. Um, so that's what I had for you today. So I covered a uh, large gamut of, you know, different uh, issues, solutions, um, and then specifically around last mile that is happening. And I'd be happy to take any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you, Alan, for such a dynamic presentation on a very timely topic. I think this is a topic that has touched us all, so thank you. Um, we do have several questions from the audience. The first is, uh, was the intern you mentioned a student at Kennesaw State? I believe this is the individual you mentioned who's been highly successful in launching a new venture. 
who was is it who was that student uh what whether the intern you mentioned was a student at Kennesaw State no no um actually no he had um he had gone to school in in China he was living in in China when we uh recruited him for for that uh for that program um but his his company is called Dorabot um and uh it is again a uh, picking technologies company, which there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of competition out there. Companies like uh, Right Hand Robotics um, and 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 others that are doing this type of technology. But what's so interesting is it's it's really not about the the actual physical the arm picking. They use you know existing technology for that. It's really about the algorithms and the machine learning um, that's, that really makes those solutions tick. Great, thank you. And we have another question here. Do you think the logistics industry will embrace the gig economy model for last mile delivery like what Amazon is doing with Amazon Flex having freelance, freelance drivers deliver packages? Um, that's a that's a really good question. Um, I think that you are going to see more of that because, you know, quite frankly, if you if you think about kind of the incumbent logistics companies, they're not set up for milk runs for back and forth that's kind of required for same day, um, and they it's really hard for them to go off route. They have a, their vehicles are loaded full in the morning. They go make these highly efficient deliveries, and then they follow a specific route to make pickups in the afternoon, and they, they come back full. Um, so it's a very, you know, even though it's, you know, it's still delivering packages, it's architecturally different than what they do today. It's really important to understand that. And, and so um, I think that, um, I think you know there are some companies like it'd be really hard for um, the USPS or um, UPS to do that because of kind of you know labor issues. Um, FedEx is set up to do that because they already use contractors um, in their ground network. But I think we're going to see some really interesting business models. There's some really um, uh, fascinating work being done at, at Georgia Tech um, around mobile delivery hubs, um, which, uh, you know, is basically taking trailers from regional distribution centers and putting them on the outskirts of cities where companies can, you know, gig workers can go back and forth making um, uh, deliveries from that. So there's a lot of interesting models being contemplated, but um, it's going to be hard for the incumbents to switch. And um, just one more point on this, and I'll go back to disruptive innovation. Um, in the history of disruptive innovation, what allows startups to get into the market is the incumbents keep focusing on higher margin, higher end products. And it, it makes perfect logical sense. I have limited capacity, so I'm going to focus on areas where I can get the most profit um, from the deployment of that capacity. It makes sense. Um, but when you do that, you open up the low end of the market for new competitors, which is actually what's happening right now in the fastest growing section of logistics, which is last mile. So that's why I say this is uh, really the most fascinating area and the, the most disruption that I've seen in my logistics career. Thank you, Alan. It looks like we have a couple of additional questions. Uh, one is, have you seen any novel e-commerce physical security issues that are unique to last mile delivery changes? Um, no, I, I, I haven't. Um, but what I, but what I will say is that um, cybersecurity has to be top of mind um, for all these companies. And it's actually one of the things that concerns me the most. Um, because as you get to a more fragmented supply chain where 
you're using uh, multiple third parties um, for warehousing, like in the shared warehousing model, these shared warehousing models, or um, you know, gig workers, and you have to share information um, with many more delivery providers. Um, this is sensitive information, right? It's it's what companies are or what individuals are buying has their address information. It's really really important uh, to protect that. And um, I do have concerns as the as these supply chains become more fragmented um, that there is a, a risk of cybersecurity issues and we're in need of more solutions in that area. Thank you, Alan. And finally, one audience member asked whether there'll be a replay available for this meeting. And the answer is yes. So we are recording all of our Lunch and Learn sessions and a recording of this session will be posted within a few days to our website and uh, that that website URL is uh, noted in the Q&A panel but uh, just to reiterate it is https uh, colon double forward slash manufacturing dot gotech dot edu and you can find it under the uh, news and events section where we have recordings of past lectures posted and those are all the questions that I see at this time. So thank you so much, Alan, for a wonderful presentation. And thank you to our audience members for joining today. And uh, please visit the GTMI website for uh, if you'd like to review the recording of this broadcast and to um, be aware of any upcoming lectures that we have planned. Thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Thank you.